Hello and welcome to The Progress Theory, where we discuss scientific principles for optimising human performance. I am Dr Phil Price and on today's episode we are joined by sports physiologist and coach Evan Pycon. Now, Evan is back on the podcast for round two and in today's episode we're going to be discussing his work with Knox, where he is a co-founder and a researcher. Now, Knox is a NIRS device which looks at muscle oxygenation and saturation, and it is also the first device to ever measure nitric oxide non-invasively. So what we thought we'd do in this episode is discuss the physiological determinants of performance for hybrid athletes and then see how we can use Knox to inform our hybrid training. As always, head to our YouTube channel, head to our Instagram page, The Progress Theory, and give us a subscribe. Here is Evan Pycon. Evan, how are we? Thank you for coming back for round two on the progress theory. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me again. Yeah, I've really been looking forward to this one, especially because so much has happened since then. Obviously, you've started Knox, uh, you released a book, and there's so much uh, that I wanted to talk to you about. And because you've created uh, a device that can be used for training, it just seemed to make sense with this season's theme that okay, how would you potentially utilize that device for training to actually reach sort of the pinnacle of a particular sport, particular pe- profession, that type of thing. So yeah, I've been particularly looking forward to this one. And obviously I want to know more about Knox because I want a, uh, I want a device myself or several devices. <laughs> so I'm in the process of speaking to those at the university to try and raise a bit of money to try and get a few devices for some of my research. So um, this is, you know, obviously this isn't going to be a, a sales pitch this episode, but because we've got so much to talk about, but I am looking forward to learning more from yourself. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this one as well. I remember last time we were on, we wanted to dive into some of this a little bit and I wasn't really uh, able to <laughs> yeah. fully disclose a lot of information. So yeah. there's a lot of, uh, I wish I could say this, but maybe next time. Mm. We were talking just before this, weren't we? Just how frustrating that was for you because... You had so many ideas that you wanted to discuss and obviously you you couldn't do it until uh, everything had kind of finished, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, one of the things that I love to do is just create content. So even Mm -hmm. just being able to write, like uh, put out articles, things like that, it was frustrating for me because there's a lot of things that I want to write about and I would actually write the articles and write posts just because it's the way that I uh, clarify my own thoughts. Mm -hmm. And then I just sat on it for like two years and I'm like, well, never going to release this or I'm not going to release this for a few years. So that was pretty frustrating mm-hmm. as well. Actually, that's a really good starting point because I wanted to ask some questions around, because you have two sub stacks. You've mm-hmm. got your emerging performance one and you've got the um, new one, the decoding biology one as well. That's come out mm-hmm. relatively recently. Yep. And I've been really enjoying both of those and I'll put the uh, links in the show notes as well for anyone listening that wants to you know, get involved with your newsletter as well. But um, yeah, interesting to hear about, you know, writing is kind of your thought process. A lot of a lot of ideas come to your head and you need to try and have, to synthesize and make sense of them and just get them onto paper. Um, even if you didn't do a newsletter, would you still do that? Is that just your way of creating new ideas and knowledge for, for your work? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the funny things is that when I started first, like creating content and putting out long form articles and things like that. There was like a two year period where every week I was putting up two to three posts, like putting up an article per week. And I had a friend that reached out. He's like, dude, I know you're busy with like work and projects. How are you creating all this content? And I was like, oh, I'm not writing any of this. I wrote most of this like five years ago. I just have literally five to 600 posts pre-written in all these articles because I wrote them for myself at the time. So it was more of just like editing and rewording and being able to post them at a pretty fast rate. So yeah, even if I couldn't share this, I would be doing it anyway, Mm. because that's the way that I learn. I mean, that's actually why I have a sub stack. It's selfishly because um, the process of teaching things and explaining it in a way that someone without context could understand Mm. clarifies my own thinking. So that's the reason why I could remember like papers off the top of my head and remember a lot of concepts. It's because because I've taught them so many times. You say that you are being selfish because it's, you know, the Substack is technically for you, but is that the best way of doing it? If you're constantly writing with key people in mind, you can never really synthesize your thoughts because you're thinking about what they would think about what you're writing. Mm-hmm. Is that a tongue tie yeah, so there? Totally. Yeah, so 
generally, like for example, with the decoding biology substack, um, each of those articles is probably about three to four weeks of me thinking through the ideas myself. And for each of those articles, there's probably like multiple flow charts and concept models and a lot of code on the back end that no one reading those articles will ever see. So that's me learning it myself, being able to think through this and understand it. And that's obviously a really critical component of understanding something. But then the process of transforming that into something simpler that I could give someone without any of that context, maybe they don't even know anything about machine learning, but they could read that article, kind of get the gist and maybe do something a little practical with it. That also helps me better understand concepts myself, because oftentimes I'll spend weeks on a topic and I'll think I'll really understand it. And then someone will ask me a question and I can't explain it to them. And I realize that I don't actually know it as well as I thought I did. So the process of simplifying and kind of thinking through someone else's perspective to see, will they understand this, actually allows me to spot the gaps in my own thinking. So that's something that's been really uh, mm. kind of critical for me. What made you decide to start the decoding biology one? Because that's come out relatively recently. Uh, and it, it, did you do like a recent, is it a recent course at MIT? on something similar, am I thinking? Oh, um, I may have got that wrong. Apologies if I have. Yeah, so after um, I finished my master's, which was in physiology and pharmacology, very unrelated to machine learning, I wanted to spend more time on that. So it's in context, my dad um, does a lot of like AI research and has always been very involved in coding my whole life. So for 30 years now, I've seen him coding and it looks like he's in the matrix with numbers streaming across the computer and never had any idea what was going on. And he was telling me for maybe the past 15 years, that like, oh, you would love this. You should spend some time learning to code. Yeah. And I've always been interested in biology. I was like, I don't care about coding or machine learning. Like, I'm not a computer scientist. I never really had any interest in that. But as I started getting more involved with both using and building wearables and collecting a lot of data, I started to realize, oh, maybe there's some use for understanding these concepts, particularly with... Uh, working with very like high dimensional data. So for example, if you and I were looking at something like uh, someone's systolic blood pressure and their risk of stroke, you have a bunch of people's data, it's like a pretty linear relationship. Oh, the higher your systolic blood pressure, the higher your risk of stroke. We can look at that, interpret it. No need to use like advanced statistics to understand the relationship between those. But what if we wanted to understand someone's risk of dementia and we had 50 different input variables? You have their whole brain volume, their age, their socioeconomic status, uh, their blood pressure, cholesterol, all of these different factors. And you're trying to map all 50 of those things to one output. That's more than the human brain is ever really going to be able to comprehend, particularly when there's really complex relationships between all of those different data points. So that was originally the interest in both learning to code and learning to use machine learning. Mm -hmm. It was to better understand biology and uh, apply that to the things that I'm really interested in. And yet, to your point, I spent about six months at MIT studying uh, data science and computer science and doing kind of like a semi-like mentorship program there with some professors. After that, um, I felt like I kind of drank through a fire hose. I was like, oh, I really understand these things. And then when I started trying to put it into practice, I realized it's like, oh, I maybe retained 4% of what I learned. I don't even remember some of these terms. And I look at the formulas and I'm like, I don't know what these Greek symbols are that are written down in my notebooks. So decoding biology is a way for me to take everything that I learned, go back through my notes and actually uh, codify that knowledge so I could actually use it for something practical. No, that's, that's really cool. I remember that a lot of the time when people have a particular question, people just seem to assume that that person will know or have the tools that they need to answer that question. A lot of the mm -hmm. time we don't. So we then, you know, that's why we put all this time and effort and money into further education. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's, it's quite interesting to hear that, you know, as you learnt biology and you started to um, put everything to practice, you know, with training think tank and all of that, you know, these questions came about and you realised that, oh, I needed to expand my skill set. And uh, my dad's been utilising a skill set <laughs> uh, all that time. I better get him, get involved. And I'm really seeing more and more things in research regarding machine learning and how it can be potentially used. And like you said, you know, people aren't really looking at uh, simple linear correlations at the moment. You know, they're developing 
huge mixed models to try and mm-hmm. determine all of these different input variables and how they can be potentially together linked towards a particular outcome, whether it would mm-hmm. be illness, performance or anything. So uh, I, I'm seeing a lot more of it in the UK in terms of sport. So I yeah. think that's the way everything's going. Um, I did notice that you had a Python book behind you. Uh, is yeah, there, yeah. Do, you, do you code in Python in particular or do you have a number of different platforms where you use yeah. code? Yes, I'd say like 95% is Python. Hmm. And then I'll use like a little SQL for like database management and like a tiny bit of R, mainly because there are a lot of books that I want to read that are only like about hmm. the language R, which is similar enough to Python that I could read that and kind of like map it back to Python because, again, that's what I do almost all my coding in. And Mm. at least in 2023, that's kind of like the main language for machine learning applications is most people uh, use Python, particularly in bioinformatics. Uh, The vast majority of courses are taught using Python as well. I've been meaning to try and teach myself for quite some time. I've been using, well, I use MATLAB for my PhD and I know a little bit of R. Um, but I have not used Python, so that is something for the next few years, I think. Also, obviously, we've talked about your substacks, but you released a book as well, Paradigm Shift, um, mm-hmm. which I thought I've read, I thought was absolutely incredible. And what was, is that a similar thing? You had all of this information written up and you synthesized it together to format it into a book and then release that similar time as when Knox started to come out? Yeah, so the paradigm shift that I actually wrote that towards the beginning of COVID. So I got contacted by a publisher that wanted to do like a book project. Um, ended up not really liking the terms on that. So I ended up writing the book and I was like, you know, maybe I'll self publish this, uh, finish the book, realize self publishing is really expensive. And I didn't want to spend that money. So instead, my idea was, okay, I'll just give it out for free instead. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <That's> incredibly <laughs> there generous. Wasn't, there wasn't that much more thought into it yeah. than that. What was the? What is it about self-publishing that was particularly expensive? Is it about the you know generating the right covers and all of that type of thing? Mm-hmm. I mean, I've only looked into yeah. self-publishing through Amazon. So, mm-hmm. yeah, so it's a mixture of like the copy editing, uh, like proper formatting, and then a lot of it to uh, the images too. But then I. My idea, I really wanted to pick a physical printed book. Mm. So after learning about all those steps, like the copy editing, the printing process, getting all the images professionally made and reformatted, and then actually making the books, I was like, this is going to be so much money for me that I didn't really care to make a profit on the book per se. Mm. But I was like, this is actually going to cost me so much money that I'm not going to, you know, spend essentially uh what would be the equivalent to like 10 to 15,000 euros uh just to put out a book so instead I was like you know what I'll make it an ebook I don't like ebooks as much but that way I could just do it for free and get it off my hands quickly mm. and just get it out into the world it was essentially sitting in my google drive for a few years not doing anything <laughs> so yeah it doesn't really help anyone well i'm very thankful for the free book anyway and i'm sure most people that have read it as well will think that as well but anyone that hasn't I definitely recommend. Where can people access it, actually? Um, is it through your Instagram or? Yeah, so right now um, on the Knox website, which is nnoxx.com, if you scroll all the way down on the homepage, there's a download link to it. Um, that would be the easiest way. Mm. Cool. Yeah, I'll put that in the show notes as well for anyone that's listening. I think that's a nice segue into start talking about Knox. What, what is Knox? Yes, yeah, so Knox is it's a physical wearable device, but also an online analysis platform. So the cool thing about Knox is a device is that it's the first and only device to measure muscle oxygenation and nitric oxide in the blood, non-invasively and in real time. So a lot of people might be familiar with muscle oxygenation. Uh, Moxie measures it for them, uh, Humon or Portamon, but nitric oxide has never been measured non-invasively or in real time. So that's really novel measurement, the reason that that's important is the specific form of nitric oxide that we measure that's released from red blood cells is the primary regulator of blood flow and oxygen delivery in the small blood vessels of a muscle tissue. So you could effectively think of it like a blood flow measurement in real time, Hmm. 
We also measure a handful of other things like local muscle oxygen consumption, uh, internal training load, which is effectively a measure of how much metabolic work a muscle tissue does, and then things like skin temperature and acceleration. So the way that I tend to explain Knox is it's like a lab and a thumb-sized mm -hmm. device. So if you're stuck at a USB stick or you have uh, relatively average-sized hands, the device is about as skinny and long as your thumb. You can put on any muscle in the body and then exercise and stream all of that data in real time. And when you're done with the workout, you log into an online web-based platform and you could easily do more like complex and robust analysis on it. So it's like a pretty smooth end-to-end -end system for collecting physiologic data that you could use to personalize your exercise, reduce injury risk, track progress, um, really anything that you want to play yeah. around with. But if you wore it during a particular training session, it would store the information and then you can link it up with the software to sort of go back and track what you actually did in that particular uh, session. The only reason I asked that, because I've used NIS uh, devices in the past, which because of the Bluetooth, I had to exercise very near where the dongle was linked to the laptop. So that was, <laughs> that was fine yeah. when, uh, you know, obviously using a stationary bike, but if I wanted to do something involving running, uh, not outside, you know, not in a treadmill, it became <clears throat> a bit trickier. Yeah, so this, um, the device syncs up to your mobile phone. So if you have iOS or Android, you could actually stream the data to your phone in real time. Um, the range from device to phone, I believe, is about uh, 100 meters. So as long as you're within the general vicinity of your phone, you could stream the data. Um, we tend to recommend that you keep it on you, though, particularly when you're outside, that could decrease that range. So yeah, you could, for example, the other day I put like a mount on my road bike had my phone mounted on it with streaming data to my phone while I was road biking, finished my session. By the time I got back in my house and signed into my computer, the data was already there in my dashboard. Nice. No, I did see that uh, Instagram story and I thought that was very, very cool. Um, how, how come, is there a reason why nitric oxide has not been measured non-invasively before? Is it particularly difficult? Or um, has, yeah, well, how, how come this is the first? I mean, it's great that it's the first, but uh, yeah. it's the first that's non-invasive. So mm. how have you managed to do that? I think is what I'm trying to ask. Yeah, so the short answer is yes. Yeah. So people were actively trying to measure this non-invasively and in real time for 20 to 30 years now. Mm. Um, so we're the first that were able to accomplish it. And I really think that the only reason that that was possible is we have a handful of people from such diverse backgrounds and their skills complemented each other so well and in such a way that we were able to figure this out. I really think if there was any given person on our team that wasn't there, from our optical engineer to our software developer to a physician scientist on our team mm. um, to myself, we really wouldn't have been able to figure it out. So I think it was really just like the right people being in the same room Mm. And then uh, having the funding to be able to work on this, it, I mean, it took us almost two years to develop that measurement. So mm. it was a pretty uh, in-depth process. Yeah. How did the team get together? It sounds like a real, <laughs> it's like the Avengers. You've got all got different superpowers. Uh, but I know you're yeah. also a co-founder. How did, how did this team uh, get together to create Nox? Yes, I'd say a lot of random chance. For being completely uh, hmm. honest, it was um, actually originally the company we weren't even trying to measure nitric oxide. We had a totally different uh, thing that we were looking into. And at some point, uh, the idea of measuring nitric oxide came into our minds as something of interest. So we kind of pivoted the company into that. Um, we connected with a physician scientist named Jonathan Stamler, who uh, hmm. anyone that's familiar with snow hemoglobin or... Uh, red blood cell mediated vasodilation research. He's like the guy in that field. So he was obviously a really critical component. Uh, we connected with a really amazing optical engineer that it just so happened that one of my co-founders was best friends with this guy's brother. Um, and he was a really critical piece in this process. So yeah, it was a lot of kind of random circumstance and things just happened. And uh, that all made it possible. No, that's really cool. It's nice when chance and things seem to fall into place. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to discuss Knox in a very practical term. 
And then I know last, last time you were on the progress theory, we talked about hybrid training or CrossFit athletes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when I mentioned hybrid training, you you kind of linked hybrid training or you perceive hybrid training to be very much towards tactical athletes. So mm-hmm. I'm assuming you know, people that work in the military, they need to be strong, fast, but also need to cover great distances uh, over a long period of time. Um, so, you know, very they require the physiological skills uh, and qualities that are very similar to a hybrid athlete. Um, so my question for you in terms of, before we start to look into how we would use NOx to influence training, would be what are the physiological determinants of performance for a tactical athlete? And then that might lead us to start thinking about how we would use NOx and develop training programs to improve performance in this area. Yeah, yeah, totally. So I'll even broaden that out a little bit and use the hybrid athlete terminology because I think uh, depending on what we call a hybrid athlete, it really changes what the physiologic predictors are. So on one end of like the hybrid athlete spectrum, uh, we could say someone who competes in a powerlifting competition and they're simultaneously training for an ultramarathon or a triathlon. By definition, I mean, that's a hybrid athlete. It's concurrent training. Mm. But uh, what we need to keep in mind is those are two discrete and car compartmentalized things. They're doing strength training for a highly specific strength goal. They're doing endurance training for a highly specific endurance goal. Not a lot of overlap between the two. On the other end of the spectrum, we might have a tactical athlete or a CrossFit athlete where, again, they need to be strong, fast, enduring, but it's just like all mishmash together and they need to be able to do all of those things at the same time. I like to think more about that tactical and CrossFit athlete. It's a little bit more interesting to me. And I think one of the biggest... Uh, determining factors there would be, we would call it their cardiovascular control systems. So what cardiovascular control essentially means is how well do you get oxygenated blood to your working muscles and utilize those? And it sounds pretty straightforward. You know, you think of VO2 max, you take oxygen into the respiratory system, you get it to the working muscles with the cardiovascular system, you utilize the oxygen, the muscles with the muscular system. And, you know, you could think of each of those processes as a discrete thing, which of those is the limiting factor, and you could train that. But it becomes a lot more complex when you think about the overall need of the human organism to maintain consciousness and uh, hopefully not black out and harm yourself while you're exercising. So whenever we're doing full body endurance sports, I mean, you think of running, cycling, they use, you know, a modest amount of total muscle mass, but it's very different than a CrossFit Metcon where you're doing thrusters and deadlifts and you're really engaging your full body. Full body endurance exercise poses absolutely insane demands on the cardiovascular system because you're simultaneously asking your body to vasodilate the working muscles to get more oxygenated blood there to, you know, maintain performance. But if you were to vasodilate all of the muscles that you're exercising during a full body endurance sport, your cardiac output could never get high enough to maintain your blood pressure. You'd instantly go unconscious, probably hit your head, wouldn't be a great day. Hmm. So your body's essentially balancing these competing needs, the need of the muscle to get oxygen and the need of the heart to not uh, have its cardiac output outstripped. So there's a huge uh, neurological component where you're having to force the sympathetic nervous system to decide where does it want to restrain blood flow. Because again, if you vasodilate all of your exercising muscles, arterial blood pressure gets too low, you black out. So you need to get sympathetic vasoconstriction to restrict blood flow to different muscles. And now you're trying to figure out where do we dilate? Where do we restrict? Um, are we still allowing adequate perfusion pressure to get blood to the brain and the heart and you know all the things that are keep us alive? So those are the types of things that I'm generally thinking about when we're talking about like true hybrid athlete performance is uh, where in that system do we need to intervene? Essentially, what is stopping someone from being able to perform? Do we need to focus on the muscular system, cardiovascular, pulmonary, uh, ability to regulate blood pressure? And that's kind of my first step in is what's their sport goal? What is the physiologic limiting system? And then from a training standpoint, well, if we know the actual goal, we know what systems are being compromised. Now, what types of adaptations do we need to go after in their training? And that's the first step into the training process for these people. So a hybrid athlete in this case, who's very good, would be the one that's able to 
vasodilate and vasoconstrict appropriately as the stress of the training session or WOD changes regularly throughout the particular session. So Mm -hmm. if, I don't know, someone's doing an exercise which is predominantly legs, uh, they're able to vasodilate the muscles of the legs so the blood gets sent there. And then all of a sudden they do something which is like a thruster where (laughs) the muscles of the legs still need to, or the blood vessels in in the muscles of the legs still need to dilate, but they need to send stuff to the upper body as well. So it's the that switch on and off of where is being dilated, where it's being constricted, whilst maintaining that pressure are the ones that are going to do better at hybrid performance purely because they are getting the oxygen needs because their ability to be able to to switch on and off. (laughs) You've nailed it. So yeah, I think that's really one of the... uh one of the biggest determining factors of what separates a elite CrossFit athlete from like a sanctional level athlete versus the average individual is putting some of these elite athletes through testing. You see their ability to swap, flip flop back and forth between vasodilating, vasoconstricting. And one of the things with a lot of sanctional level athletes I've seen is um, it's often the case these individuals, you know, they'll do a long ski erg and they'll be vasodilating a lot of muscles in their upper body, and then they'll go to do heavy squat cleans, and they're like, how oh, my legs don't work. Or they'll be on the assault bike for a really, really long period, really pushing their legs, and then they'll go to do ring muscle-ups, and they're like, the hell, like, my grip is just completely giving out because they can't redirect and get blood flow and oxygen delivery to those muscles, where that's seldom an issue for the elite athletes. They're just as good as doing squat cleans after a ski erg, is they would be if they had just ran or biked because they don't really have those restraints on their cardiovascular control systems. Using the example you just gave regarding the person that's doing the ski erg and then move to the, the squat cleans, mm-hmm. is there a limiting factor the fact that they've just come off the ski erg, everything's dilated there? Um, mm-hmm. Is it their inability to then constrict the muscles of the upper body so that it can then be diverted to the lower body? Or is it that the muscles of the lower legs can't dilate because the the body hasn't figured out that it needs to kind of constrict the muscles, <laughs> the, the blood vessels yeah. of the upper body to then sh- redirect it? Mm-hmm. Uh, I yeah, think so it's it very it different. Be- it's like, I'm trying to see it as like taps <laughs> in, in a mm-hmm. way. It's like the taps of the yeah, upper yeah. body are open. Is it the inability of the body to then close those taps to then redirect it? Or is it the fact that because those are open, the body just like, no, I'm not opening these other taps of the lower body? Yeah, so I think of it as one of two things. Is it um, that they cannot dilate in the lower body or that they will not dilate in the Mm. lower body? So it's like can't or won't. Mm. So a case where they can't would be this individual actually has impaired vasodilator capacity. Like they are literally not good at opening up blood vessels and getting oxygen delivery. Now, if you're a pretty high level athlete, that's probably not a concern. Mm -hmm. I'd say it's more likely that they won't dilate. And what that means is their brain actually won't let them. Your brain will not let you get into a situation where you're going to threaten your arterial blood pressure because when that happens, it's lights out. So if their cardiac output can't ramp up enough to maintain their blood pressure as they're diverting and redistributing their cardiac output to their lower body, their brain's not going to let them do that. Um, It's an idea of what happens when you take that break off of your brain uh, a coach at Training Think Tank and I years ago, we had this really horrible idea of not listening to the instructions that came with the BFR kit. And we did lower body BFR training for a while. And they always explicitly say in the package, do not do like lower body training and then upper body training back to back with BFR. Well, they never explain why you're not supposed to do that. Hmm. So in the name of science, we decided to test it out as we did with many things before giving it to our athletes. So we had just done like 10 sets of 10 deadlifts or something with the trap bar with both of our legs tied off. We had released, I'm like, oh man, my legs feel amazing after taking those cuffs off. I have so much blood going to my lower body. And then we cuffed up on the upper arm and we started uh, doing some form of strength training. And I was like, you know what, I still feel pretty good. And then I took those cuffs off my arms and I was like, ooh, that's a nice feeling, all the blood flowing back into my arms. Then I was like, I can't swallow right now. I was like, that's weird. I was like, why can't I swallow? And then all of a sudden I couldn't talk and I started kind of whispering. I was like, what's going on right now? Well, I was progressively blacking out. 
because my hmm. arms and my legs, a lot of muscle mass was vasodilated and I was pretty tired. So, you know, the nervous system is fatigued and I had blood flowing into all of my extremity limbs and I wasn't protecting my arterial blood pressure. And as a consequence, I was slowly blacking out on the gym floor. That's why your brain won't let you do that. So that's a very artificial situation that would never really happen in a organic workout. But that's why your brain's not going to let you do that. So if you don't have the cardiac output to support that, your brain's never going to let you just vasodilate all of these muscles because the consequence, again, is blacking out. It's a very real threat. I've got this image of you looking jacked on the floor, like not really knowing what's <laughs> going on. What the hell just happened? Yeah, I was like, I look great, but I might die here. <laughs> <laughs> You're never tempted to do that again, though. It's like, no, nah, yeah, I, I never again experimented with that. I had my uh, my uh, one shot, mm. and now I'm done. I don't need that in my life. Surely that's all in the name of science. You're always pushing boundaries, putting yourself yeah, out there, I, doing I, what, you know, I'd only give an athlete what I wouldn't, you know, what I would do myself. And it's like, I wouldn't do that again, so I'm not going to give you that. Yeah, I, I have uh, a few not-so-great experiences not listening to uh, manufacturer warnings on different pieces of sports science tech. So those things are there for a reason. <laughs> to get from like a sub-elite CrossFit athlete who's not very good at redirecting or having blood vessels, you know, constrict and, and dilate appropriately, to, to getting to that elite level, like you say, it's all about, you know, the brain won't allow you uh, to do that because it's worried about arterial blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So are we in a way training the brain to sort of say, no, hold on, we are capable of doing this appropriately through training. Mm -hmm. So the brain allows us to be able to do that properly. Yeah, I think to the extent that you are actually building up these supporting qualities that really allow you to do that. So for example, again, the brain's not going to take the brakes mm. off if your body can't support blood pressure. So for each individual, I'm always trying to think about what are their different limitations. I mean, at a sanctional level, most people have very good oxygen utilization in the muscle. I, I really don't think I've ever seen someone with an extraction limitation, minus if maybe they just came off a serious injury. So it's always one of three types of limiters. It's that their respiratory system is insufficient, you, or their cardiovascular system, uh, which would be maybe cardiac output as a limiter, or a vascular limitation, their ability to vasodilate rapidly. Um, I'd say at the most elite level in CrossFit, it's, I'd say, almost always a respiratory limitation, or at that sanction level, it's typically cardiovascular. So it's almost very two distinct physiologic profiles. Mm -hmm. Now, you could shift someone from having that cardiovascular limitation into a respiratory limitation if trained properly. But for some individuals, I mean, they've kind of reached their peak there where that's just where they're going to be limited and they might not move on to that next stage of competition. Physiologically, how, how does that, what does that look like going from cardiovascularly limited to respiratory limited? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll give kind of two different avatars. The respiratory limited one first. Um, so with these individuals, there's a lot of different ways that respiratory limitations can manifest. So I'll talk about some of the kind of quick ways that are not typically as relevant in games athletes. So you could have a structural respiratory limitation. So imagine someone that is uh, stuck in thoracic extension. A lot of times you see guys like stuck in that chest up Superman position. Well, when you're stuck in that thoracically extended position, the diaphragm can't vertically expand during respiration. So you're essentially limiting your ventilatory volumes. Typically, those people are very bad at exhaling. You know, they take a deep breath in, they never fully exhale, so they're not clearing carbon dioxide. That, you know, there are some physiologic components to that, but at the end of the day, if you don't fix the structure, you're not going to change the function. You could also have someone who's very kyphotic. They're going to be limited structurally in a different way. So all of those things aside, the main thing that I'm thinking about with the respiratory limitation at an elite level could either be diaphragm muscle uh, fatigue. So either their diaphragm is weak or it lacks fatigue resistance, typically lacking fatigue resistance. One, because it's a major respiratory muscle. It's also a spinal stabilizer. CrossFit is obviously a sport with huge spinal stabilization demands. When the respiratory muscles fatigue, your brain's going to shunt more blood and oxygen to those muscles so you don't die. And when that happens, it's going to vasoconstrict the arms and the legs. 
So with a lot of games athletes, you see this manifest in the following way. Um, they're doing a Metcon, they're pushing themselves really hard. Maybe now they're on the rower and they're like, whoa, my toes are going completely numb. Oh, my fingers are going numb. What's going on? Well, they're shunting blood towards the diaphragm to protect themselves. So I used to definitely be one of these athletes. I remember at one point I was able to do like somewhere in the mid-20 ring muscle-ups unbroken, not world's class by any means, but pretty good at the movement. And I was at a competition, and it was a 500-meter row followed by, I think, 30 ring muscle-ups for time. And I was like, oh, this is going to be an awesome event. I'm good at rowing. I think I rowed like a 120, 500-meter. And I was like, I'm going to come out really hot and then go into the ring muscle-ups. And I'd created such a huge respiratory stress on myself that I diverted so much blood that I literally could not jump and hold on to the rings. It was like a 10-minute workout. Finished the row in about a minute 20. By the end of it, I literally could not hang from the rings. I had no blood in my arms and my hands were just totally numb. So that's one example of respiratory limitation. Another would be what's called a pulmonary diffusion limitation. This is actually quite rare in the general healthy population at sea level, but it does happen in really elite endurance athletes. I've seen it happen in top CrossFit Games competitors. What this limitation is, is your cardiac output is so high that your red blood cells move through your pulmonary capillary so fast that they can't pick up oxygen. So mm. if you imagine like a delivery truck mm. going through a warehouse and you know the delivery truck's supposed to drive slow or stop and people load it up with boxes, this is the delivery truck just speeds through the warehouse and people are like trying to chuck boxes onto the back of it and they're not getting a lot of cargo on. That's exactly what's happening the red blood cell transit time is so quick that even when they come out of the heart, the blood's only about you know 90% saturated instead of close to 100. So a lot of times with these athletes, if you take a pulse oximeter measurement, it actually might even get down into the low 80s. Um, these individuals will often manifest after a Metcon, you'll see their lips will turn blue. Um, oftentimes they'll turn a little pale in the face. That's often a sign that they have a pulmonary diffusion limitation. Um, the pulse ox is often really good for double checking that. Most people will have almost no change in blood oxygenation during exercise. These individuals look like they just went up to altitude. So it's a very different type of physiology there. If that's quite rare in say a hybrid athlete, like you've just kind of described, mm -hmm. is there another sport where that's more common? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so elite distance running is where that's going to be the most common. Mm. Um, you'll also see that in like elite cross-country skiing. Uh, cycling, that's a little bit more rare just because there's not as much muscle mass being engaged. So you don't tend to get to as high cardiac outputs. Um, but I believe the first time that was documented in a case study was I think in the... God, now I'm messing up my ears, but whenever Peter Snell was running competitively, I think he was the first published case study where that was documented. Maybe that was like the late 60s or early 70s. Um, so that that's mostly seen in like elite distance running. If we now use our Knox device, let's mm -hmm. say let's say we do it for your particular uh, workout where you did the row followed by the ring muscle ups. Mm -hmm. Um and say we put knocks on the quadricep, um, mm -hmm. what kind of readings would we see? And I'm thinking more oxygen utilization, nitric oxide. Mm -hmm. What would we see in that instance? And mm -hmm. how could we potentially utilize that information? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've done similar workouts using the Knox device, uh, not that extreme. So knowing my own physiology and my measurements, what I would see during that is if I'm rowing a 500 meter at a roughly race pace intensity, off the bat, if I'm pacing, this is like a linear pace structure, I'm just going out at a 120 and I'm just going to hold that for the entire time. I'll see a very rapid uh, decrease in my muscle oxygenation. You can think of that as like a battery uh, going from roughly at baseline, maybe a 60% charge on the battery down to, for me, maybe a 20% charge. Mm. And I'm just going to hang out there the entire workout. Simultaneously, as I'm deoxygenating very rapidly, I'm going to get a huge increase in nitric oxide release because nitric oxide is the primary regulator of local muscle blood flow. So as you deoxygenate, you should get a compensatory increase in blood flow. It's called autoregulation of blood flow discovered by Arthur Guyton. That's a nitric oxide mediated response. So I'm going to get a huge increase. But after maybe 30 to 40 seconds, for me, that's going to plateau. So I'm going to reach a local maximum in my nitric oxide levels. The 
interesting thing though is because I'm also measuring my muscle oxygen consumption, uh, MVO2 measurements. Most people are familiar with VO2 with a metabolic analyzer breathing into a mask. Uh, we measure MVO2, which is the local muscle VO2 response. That will tend to kind of creep up through the entire workout because I'm essentially getting more oxygen flux in the tissue. So it's a situation where my oxygen saturation stays stable, but the oxygen consumption is going up because there's a greater blood flow component. Mm. So that's going to be what's happening in my leg. That in and of itself is pretty interesting. I mean, knowing that I could write training afterwards to try and improve that going forward. But what's going to be interesting is what's happening in my form as well. So after I get off that rower, my form is going to effectively look metabolically inert. So I do quite a bit of sport climbing. So when I'm climbing, I'm used to seeing pretty big changes in oxygenation, nitric oxide, and the forearm muscles. In that situation, since I'm not going to be able to redirect blood flow and also um, not to be able to activate those muscles as well, when I go and jump on the rings, you're going to see very little oxygen consumption in my forearms and very little changes in blood flow. So it almost looks like a tissue that just can't respond to the activity Part of that is because I'm so systemically fatigued as well. Um, so that that's, would be like that specific workout generally what we would see there. And then obviously on the tail end of that is, well, what do you actually do to change that? So for me, it would be figuring out what is the specific physiological limitation going on there? Uh, what type of training protocol do I write to improve that? And then how do I use something like the Knox device to actually guide my week-to-week -week training, track my progress, and kind of alter my decision-making? Okay. No, that's, that's really interesting because I'm assuming however you structure your training going forward, if you then did the same workout, you would want to see that your forearm musculature, you know, has an increase in nitric oxide. It has an increase in muscle oxygenation, especially utilization. You, you kind of want it to increase its numbers there because you described it yeah. as not being quite inert. There's not much there. So through training... Yeah. I guess you're altering the, if we keep it really simple, you know, you can make changes to the rowing component of the workout. You can make changes to the, mm -hmm. the ring muscle up part of the workout. Mm -hmm. You would alter those and see something different to then in mm -hmm. turn see a different response in the forearm musculature. Mm -hmm. yeah, how, yeah, totally. How would, uh, how would that look like, um, I mean, I'm thinking hypothetically, but how would that look like in terms of a training program? Like, what would you do to the rowing component to then help with the forearm not looking like it's inert? Yeah, so you could think of like a traditional like interval weight training or interval gymnastics training structure. So one, what I would try and do on week one is find what is the fastest pace I could go on the rower without actually negatively impacting the forearm musculature. So maybe it's not a 120 pace, maybe it's a 140 pace. It's so far off my competition pace that, um, you know, that's the fastest I could go without having to vasoconstrict other regions of the body and redistribute cardiac output. So first we identify what pace do, could we even train at right now? And then if we wanted to go like super simple linear progression, which is very seldom going to be the best way to do it is we could just do that same workout week after week and see, am I able to slowly get a little bit faster on the row without negatively impacting uh, blood flow in the forearm musculature, or even if we want to go even simpler, simpler, just my ability to do ring muscle ups. I mean, maybe if it's a beginner athlete, you could actually make week to week progress there. Fantastic. Makes it really simple, but that's seldom the case. Mm. So what I'd be trying to do even further is seeing, okay, what is stopping me here? Is it my cardiac output is the limitation? So we make a hypothesis. My cardiac output is the reason why I can't redistribute blood flow. So now we put a cardiac output protocol into our training. Could be whatever you want it to be. Google cardiac output <laughs> protocols, just pick something, doesn't really matter. Progress that week to week. And that is essentially the intervention. That row muscle up workout is the outcome measurement as I am progressing on this cardiac output training protocol, am I able to progressively do faster paces on the rower while maintaining my muscle up ability? If the answer is yes, you nailed it. Eventually you're gonna plateau there. 
when you plateau, is it because that cardiac output stimulus is no longer sufficient to keep adapting? Maybe you need to increase the volume or the frequency, what have you. Or is it because now you have a different limitation? So for me, program design is always this process of um, just making a hypothesis. Why can't I get better on this workout? Make an educated guess, add something to your training to improve that, and then see if you start progressing again. And, you know, you're kind of playing plug and play, changing one variable at a time. So it sounds like it could be really complex, but in practice, it's actually quite simple. You, you know, you just take good notes and you work through it one thing at a time. Yeah. It sounds, you know, it, the measurements are really quite specific, but usually the answer to try and improve them seems to be quite simple. But you talked about trying mm-hmm. to improve cardiac output. I think my original question was really quite posed as like, okay, what small changes can I do to the rowing component and the the ring muscle up component to make, mm-hmm. almost like make intervals of that workout to then in turn get better at the total workout later mm-hmm. on. It's almost like breaking down a skill and then going back to the, the full skill later on. Yeah. But really it's, like, let's actually make a, a guess around what the limiter is here. And then if it's cardiac output, like a quite basic uh, training program, which increases cardiac output over time would be more beneficial. So it's kind of like that general type training, which is going to hopefully in turn improve the specific type performance outcome variable, which in this case is this crazy workout that you did. Yeah, absolutely. I think of it like there's three kinds of training. You have limiter training, which is just trying to train the physiology. Generally, I would say this probably shouldn't look like sport. On the opposite end of the spectrum, you have sport training, which for a CrossFit athlete could be doing Metcons uh, or some sport-like component. And then in the middle, you have what would be called like bridge training. It's kind of the bridge between pure limiter training, pure sport training. That tends to look a little bit more like uh, when people think of like a competitive CrossFit athlete's training, like intervals or subcomponents of the sport. So for me, I'm always trying to think, okay, I know what I want to have this athlete get better at in the sport. Do we need to improve the physiology? If so, I tend to do that in isolation and then try and create some kind of bridge between that pure limiter work to transfer those skills back into the sport. So at all times of the year, we're always doing some combination of like limiter bridge performance training and you just kind of like turn one dial up, turn the other dials down. So maybe in the off season, it's a lot of limiter based training, maybe, you know, 50 or 60% of training, maybe uh, 20 to 30 is bridge training and a very small percentage of sport closer to the season, maybe 50% of training becomes bridge training. And then you're turning that limiter training, the dial down, turning sport up. So that way you're always building things and maintaining. You're never really going between these like very discrete training phases. It's always essentially doing the same things, but in different volumes and frequencies. That sounds very familiar in terms of all sports in a way. You know, you kind Mm, of move it. You know, focusing on the limiter is a bit more of the GPP. And then as you're going Mm -hmm. towards the competition, it's more the specific preparatory phase. Um, Mm -hmm. I recently read, I don't know if you've read it, the How to Skate 10K by... Van der Poel, uh, the speed skater. Yeah, I that. I'll have to send it your way. It, um, but he really makes a big case as to like how long his sort of aerobic block is. And I mm-hmm. have recently wondered if for like CrossFit athletes, you know, are people trying to train the sport too much uh, and mm-hmm. therefore they miss focusing on, you know, on their limiters and mm-hmm. the training for their limiters often takes a lot of time to try and improve on. Um, so because they don't give themselves the time to actually improve on them, they don't see the improvements that they, at the sport that they should do. Yeah, definitely. And I think it goes both ways. For example, when I was at training think tank, we used to see a lot of athletes that would essentially come to us because they were doing the sport way too much. They're like, I'm essentially peaked year round. I need to, you know, get better at building the base. So that was one case, but there'd also be a lot of people who, you know, they would follow us. They would see that we talk about these fundamentals, but then you would consult with them and you're like, Oh, you're, you're doing way too much of building the base and you're not doing enough of the sport. So I think people could fall into both extreme camps where they're doing way too much sport or like way too much base. You look at their training and you're like, all you do is easy biking and like strength training. There's no sport in here. So I think it's some balance between the two is probably right for most CrossFit athletes. Yeah, yeah. Say I'm a a CrossFit athlete and I'm doing my sort of easy bike, but at the same time I'll do my 
Uh, let's stay with the bike. Let's say I'm doing some form of tempo type training uh, and we don't have to worry about like, you know, particular zones. You know, these are uh, slightly higher in intensity. Uh, and the reason mm-hmm. I want to ask this is, is how would I utilize Knox to determine that I am kind of in that intensity area that I think is appropriate? You know, what, what, how can I use the measures that Knox give me to try and help uh, monitor and guide my interval type training? Yeah, totally. So that's actually a really great question. So what I would say is you could use a few different measurements on the Knox device. I'll start with muscle oxygenation because a lot of people are familiar with that. So probably everyone listening to this um, has heard of heart rate training zones. So, you know, generally we associate certain heart rate training zones with being at a low intensity, certain heart rate zones at a maximal intensity. And generally that tends to work pretty good as a heuristic. But first let's talk about where does heart rate tend to break down? One is if you're in uh, very hot temperatures, you get a lot of cardiac lag. So you'll see an upward drift in heart rate, even though your actual intensity is not changing because you're diverting more blood to the skin to cool yourself. So in very high temperatures, heart rate, not a great measurement. Uh, If you're very dehydrated or stressed, not a great measurement. This is why heart rate variability is actually a good proxy of your stress or recovery. It's because heart rate is so sensitive to these things. Then the third one would be um, with very rapid short lasting changes in intensity. So imagine you're running and all of a sudden you go over a small hill or downhill, you're kind of changing terrain. Or for a CrossFit athlete, maybe you're doing a kind of like a long cyclical piece and you're adding in some squat cleans or things like that. The temporal nature of heart rate is such that you won't pick up on these very small variations in intensity. So these are some of the limitations. Now, where does muscle oxygenation maybe become a better measurement? One is uh, you actually pick up on many of these fast temporal changes in intensity because instead of measuring your systemic stress, you're measuring directly in the exercising muscle. So you might be doing a nice steady easy bike and you hop off to a squat queen. That squat queen might take two seconds, but you'll see your muscle oxygenation. It's hanging steady at 40% on the bike, drop down to 10% on the squat queen, shoot back up. Same thing if you're running on hills or changing terrain, you could actually see variations in that signal as you go up a little incline, your muscle oxygenation goes down. As you go um, down a hill, muscle oxygenation goes up, and you might actually see a steady heart rate in that situation, but you're actually seeing these variations in the muscle. So those are some of the big ones, but I think for a CrossFit athlete, the low intensity is a huge one. There are so many CrossFit athletes you really rely on like high threshold motor strategies, even doing low intensity work. I'm thinking of the guys who are like generally pretty big. They might be on an assault bike at 100 to 120 beats per minute. And they're like, yes, doing my low intensity aerobic work, nice low heart rate. Their peripheral tissues might be totally hypoxic in that circumstance. <laughs> so when you're measuring the muscle, you're like, dude, you're hanging out at like 25% muscle oxygenation. Your tissues are not getting the... Uh, easy recovery benefit that you think like in Mm. fact a lot of times you'll hear those athletes come in the next day and they'll go to lift heavy and they're like my legs are just like shot but yesterday was my easy intensity day well no it's because you essentially held your legs in a uh, hypoxic chamber for an hour on the bike so that's one of their good use cases the other is that you could use a combination of muscle oxygenation or muscle oxygen consumption to create uh, muscle based training zones So you could say, for example, you would need to know this for yourself, but for myself, um, if we want to use like uh, the critical power based terms of like easy, moderate, hard, severe, maximal, my easy muscle oxygenation zone is anything above 60%. My uh, moderate would be like a 60 to 45. My hard is like a 45 to high 30s. My severe is like a high 30 to roughly just under 30, and then anything under that's a maximal effort. So if I wanted to go in today and I'm like, okay, I want to do some like VO2 max based intervals. I want to be in the hard intensity domain. I'm going to hop on the bike and I'm just going to hold my muscle oxygenation in that correct zone. The interesting thing about this versus traditional interval training is how wildly the wattages could change over the course of an interval. So instead of saying, I'm going to do four minutes at 375 watts, rest four minutes and do that four times, like a classic four by four interval. I might say, I'm going to 
hop on the bike and I'm just going to hold my muscle oxygenation in this tight zone, no matter what the wattage is. So I might have to ramp up to 600 watts to start, be there for like 30 seconds, come back down into the low 300s and kind of fluctuate over the course of the interval because that's the way the body works. It's not a linear system. Mm. It could actually be uh, fluctuating intensities or what you would need to be in that specific zone. So what we're doing with this technology is essentially um, removing the assumptions that a specific wattage creates a specific physiologic output. And instead, we're just, you know, changing our intensity or our power output based on what's really happening in the tissue. So that would be one of the simplest ways to use the technology. Is that one of the most... I say simplest, but one of the most important because a lot of people are doing like what you described, you know, okay, I've got a, an interval for five minutes at, I don't know, 300 watts, whatever the erg is. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, it's essential that I stay at that 300 watts. And, you know, mm-hmm. the, uh, their effort is going to completely change from the beginning to the end, including their perception of the effort. Um, even mm-hmm. when people often use RPE, it's like, okay, try and go for an interview mm-hmm. RPE, I don't know, seven or eight. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, Typically, they'll start the interval pretty, um, usually around that uh, RPE, but, but as the, they start to tire throughout the interval, uh, the effort increases. So all of a sudden, they, they think that I need mm. to maintain this particular speed or whatever it might be. Yeah. But by doing that, they've just creeped up their RPE. Mm. So people often aren't that great at... Um, you know, they're so focused on things like pace, wattage, whatever it might be. And by doing that, they actually get completely different physiological responses from the beginning of the tempo to the end of the tempo or or interval. Um, So that was going to be one of my next questions because you talked about just trying to remain nice and level within that that muscle oxygenation, whether it would be 60%. Uh, Because I know that once you get started with the interval, obviously you're going to have uh, a bit where the oxygen uh, supply is bigger than the the consumption and then Mm. later on as the intensity increases for example if you increase the intensity of the intervals you're going to get to a bit when consumption is much greater than the delivery Um, so because of that if we're doing sort of like zone training surely monitoring this is really quite important because it's the only way we truly know that we're staying in the right zone Yeah, exactly. It allows you to make these very fast and dynamic adjustments based on what zone your body is at at any given point. Because particularly like with heart rate, your stress on the cardiovascular system could grossly misrepresent what's going on in the muscle. But also these zones change day to day as well to a degree that if you were only using power to guide your training, you'd be surprised how different these things could be. So my zone three, for example, could be at 250 watts one day and 450 watts the next day. And there's not always even a lot of correlation with how you feel as well. So it's also knowing that, you know, things really change depending on what you've done the day prior, how uh, metabolically active that tissue is. Um, An example of when I first started really noticing this myself is there was a period just for more of like experimental purposes and, you know, uh, doing some validation on myself. I wore the Knox device on the uh, lateral head of my tricep in the exact same spot every single day and started every training session with a different tricep exercise. And I wanted to see how do different uh, exercises that bias the short head or the long head impact the muscle oxygenation signal? How does fatigue and things like that impact it? So I had a pretty good understanding of what normalized ranges are for myself. So then I went on vacation. I was in Ireland for about a week, came back, first day back in the gym, you know, picked back up with my experiment. I was like, oh my God, my changes in muscle oxygenation are so much bigger than usual. I was like, this is incredible. I'm getting like so much metabolic activity in this tissue because I was non-fatigued and usually I'm really never in a circumstance that I'm fully recovered. And then I was like, okay, that's amazing. But the next day, because... I had taken an entire week off of training. I had severe DOMS, which is pretty unusual for me. I just never really get sore because I never really take that much time off of training. So it's like, this is a great opportunity to go in and see what the data looks like. So I put the device on, started doing tricep extensions. There's like no change in muscle oxygenation. Literally looked like I had the device in like a corpse um, where the day before I was getting like a 50% change in the oxygenation signal with each individual muscle contraction. So I would extend signal would drop from 60 to 10%. 
I would relax for a second. It would shoot back up to 60, this huge dynamic range. The day that I doms, it was like a 3 to 5% change in the signal with each rep. I was like, what is going on? Well, when you have DOMS, it's because you're creating micro trauma on the muscle fiber. You actually impair that tissue's oxidative capacity. So you could see it's kind of like a dead tissue. Now, on that day, hypothetically, that was like an important day in my training week. I'm supposed to bench press and do all these different things, and I do it anyway. I'm probably not going to benefit from it that much because the tissues aren't actually able to handle that stress. So there's also some component to using this to decide well, what is my readiness? Like, should I be adjusting training based on something like heart rate variability? Or could I adjust training based on what's actually happening in the muscle, which tends to correlate more with performance and adaptation? And then even tracking progress week to week, seeing, uh, for example, one of the things with hybrid athletes I've noticed is a lot of people are like, oh, hybrid training only works for a few weeks and you plateau. Part of that could just be that people progress things way too quick. So as a side note, something that athletes that I've coached for a while tend to simultaneously love and hate is I always say like, you're never going to make a 20 pound PR on any of my programs, but you'll make 20 one pound PRs. And it's because we're always making like very, very minor adjustments to training. So the way that I think about this is you want runway for progression. Imagine you're standing on a dock and they're laying down one plank at a time. Well, if you want to be able to progress indefinitely, don't start walking on that dock at a faster rate than they're laying down planks. You're just going to walk right off the end. You always want to be a little bit of a step behind. So that's something that you could use this technology for as well. So for example, I was doing assault bike intervals uh, a few weeks ago. And each week I was either progressing volume or intensity. I got to a point where I think I did like six intervals of a minute at 400 something watts. And I was like, you know, that was pretty tough. The next week I came in, I was like, okay, I could try and progress something, but I feel like if I do, I'm just going to like absolutely wreck myself and I'm not going to progress another week. So I just did the exact same workout. And afterwards I overlaid my muscle oxygenation data and I was like, oh, these are like pretty identical. So I really didn't improve anything in the past week. So I just did that workout again another week and then a third week. And after three or four weeks of doing the exact same workout, by the end of it, I saw I'm not utilizing as much oxygen in the muscle anymore as I was that first week. So even though on paper, I've done the exact same workout every single week, you would say you've made no progress whatsoever. I could actually see the changes in physiology week after week. And that tells me that um, on week one, I'd kind of exhausted my runway of progression. But if I keep repeating that workout, I'm letting that dock extend a little bit further out. And after that fourth week, I could keep increasing volume or intensity again and extend that runway. So there's a lot of that as well for hybrid athletes is figuring out, well, like, how much runway do you really have to make progress on this? Should you just like hang steady on that back squat progression and let something else progress? And then that way, you don't really ever have to radically change the program. You just let everything progress at a very small, um, kind of like little baby steps along the way. Yeah. I'm sure, like you, I mean, you said that a lot of people complain about hybrid training that it only works for a few weeks. Where I often find that if there's ever going to be any type of stagnation or decrease in performance, and I guess within the literature they've linked this to this interference effect, it's purely because mm -hmm. they've progressed too quickly, mm -hmm. and yeah. and that kind of shows how important utilizing the Knox device is because you could be, I don't know, doing a number of intervals at a particular wattage. And if you are not staying in that particular sort of same steady level of muscle oxygenation, um, then you could be potentially progressing too aggressively without actually thinking you are progressive, uh, progressing at all. Yeah. So like wattage stays the same for four weeks, but actually you've just um, mm -hmm. just plowed yourself into chronic fatigue over four weeks by just doing mm -hmm. the same thing, just because the physiological response is completely different to what you think is actually happening. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I really do think people need to uh, think physiologically a little bit more rather than just sort of, uh, sort of gross numbers, which they often see, um, which shows how important this and, and why it's quite important that these devices, certainly in the last decade, have become more readily available to athletes, coaches, that type of thing. So, yeah, it's yeah, definitely interesting to see. And we definitely, I, I definitely agree when it comes to, you know, progressing slowly. 
Um, I've mm-hmm. seen it described in that way and in, in a number of different ways as well, but it always comes down to the same thing. Like you can train hard, but just progress slowly. Um, yeah. And yeah, that's absolutely. when you're going to make the the right progress in especially hybrid training when you're, you, you've got so many different things competing for the same sort of energy that you have. Um, yeah. <laughs> don't try and expend that, trying to give it too much to too many things. Yeah, I think I've heard, I think it was Steve Magnus, a track and field coach that I heard explain it is like, don't go there before you have to. So I think the general idea is like, say you do like uh, six 400 meter intervals this week and you want to progress, you come in week two and you're like, I know I could do 10. Mm. Well, it's like, well, instead just do eight, extend your runway of progression. Then maybe you go nine, 10, 11, 12, whatever, where if you go from six to 10, maybe mm. you just exhausted all of your runway for progression the next week, you're done. There's no more room to improve. So it's like, you know. Don't go any further than you have to, and then you could just keep extending things. And I think that's really important for hybrid athletes when you're trying to improve, you know, maybe a half dozen or a dozen different things. Just progress each thing like so little that it doesn't even feel any different than the previous week. And, you know, might not be fun to add one pound to your back squat, but over 52 weeks in a year, you could have these huge changes Mm -hmm. in many different physiologic variables and performance variables. And your program never really has to change all that much. I really want to see that now. Someone that starts their um, year squatting 100 kilos, and by the end of the year, it's 152. Just so you can mm-hmm. <laughs> see purely how that's yeah. particularly worked. You know, adding one kilo every week, uh, and you know, having no real dips. They're not allowed to go on holiday, not to Ireland. Yeah, Too much yeah. Guinness. No holidays, nothing. <laughs> um, just to finish off. What, what does your training look like? Because what I've liked, how you've described your training is that quite a lot of the time, training for you is like your laboratory. Like you are asking scientific questions. Um, but uh, I mean, I don't know what your total type of training is. Like if you're putting into practice this whole, you know, progress very slowly. Um, it, what, what does it look like? Yeah. Yeah, so I'd say my training for myself is a bit different than training that I would give athletes because I literally have no real performance goals. So for me, training is what I do for fun. So generally, first thing in the morning before I start work for the day, I typically uh, lift weights for about an hour. It's a very structured resistance training program that I you know, kind of tweak to my own liking. I typically do most days of the week a second workout, which is where I'm experimenting. So that workout could be... 10 minutes. If there's like a single data point I want to collect, it could be an hour. And that's where generally I will use a lot of these principles we've talked about where I'll find a performance goal and I will specifically measure certain physiologic variables and then go through this hypothesis testing protocol Mm. to see uh, what do we need to improve? What could we change? And that will be my data collection. I think that is more of uh, just me doing my job than it is training because that's where I'll build a lot of these case studies. So recently I put out a few videos on um, training for like a two-mile time trial, collecting the baseline data, and then each training session actually showing my physiologic data, comparing it to the previous week and talking about how I actually make these micro adjustments based off of it. That's a little bit more in line with how I would program for my athletes. Um, The reason I don't tend to train like that year-round for myself is one, I just don't have the time to be a true athlete anymore. And also, uh, it's a lot more difficult putting multiple hours into your own training program and microanalyzing these details uh, than it is for an athlete where, you know, you do all of that work and then there's detachment. You send them the program and they execute on it where when you're doing that program yourself, you know all of those micro details and you can't always detach from it. Mm-hmm. So you you know, you kind of overthink things as you're going. Yeah, okay. it's, it's stressful, isn't it? Like not being able to yeah, detach absolutely. by, and you're always thinking about the little things. Uh, it does have a big effect on your training that people might think. Um, but it's cool to see that, you know, you are still getting like double sessions in a day because I've always seen you as someone that writes so much, you must be like uber productive with your day. And I've always been really quite jealous. I, like, I wish I could get that much work in. Um, but uh, and still train twice a day doesn't quite happen to me at the moment but I've got a five month old son but you never know once I hit six months back in double trainings and start trying to do, trying to do a few things you know what I will say I'm probably not nearly as productive as you think I am for one um, 
too. It's a little easier when I could legitimately say that this training session is my 12 o'clock work meeting. So, <laughs> But it's in the calendar, so it counts. Yes, yes, it's in the calendar. It's a, you know, it's a scheduled meeting with myself. Yeah, exactly. They're important. Anyway, right, Evan, that was amazing. Obviously going to get you on for round three eventually. Uh, but where can people find more information about Knox? I've already talked about I'll have links with your Substacks, your book into the show notes. But if people want to find a little bit more about Knox, where should they go? Yeah, so easiest place would be Knox's website. It's spelled on nnoxx.com. So go to Knox's site. You can find all the information there. Um, you could also look up Knox on any social media platform. There's probably going to be a handle on there. So it's, it's pretty easy to find. There's not a lot of uh, nnoxxs floating around on the interwebs. Evan, thank you so much. That was amazing. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs>